Today's message is from Revelation 21, verses 1 through 7. The title of the sermon is Heavenly Perspective. And again, that the scripture that, that Pastor Jack will be preaching from is Revelation chapter 21, verses 1 through 7. Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and first earth had passed away, and there was no more sea. Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. Then he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give of the fountain of the water of life freely to him who thirsts. He who overcomes shall inherit all things, and I shall be his God, and he shall be my son. Amen. Let's pray. Father God, as we come to you now, we ask for your help. We think about those friends who have been in the hospital and had recovery. We thank you that Melissa McLeod is, is back home. We pray for her recovery. We thank you, Lord, for Gene Dashafi. We ask for your help for him as he tries to get better from pneumonia. We pray for him and his son who's taken him in. We thank you, Lord, for, for that. We also pray for Mike Radvansky as he continues to uh, get better to strong, strengthen his heart, to strengthen his body so that he may have procedure to, uh, to keep him healthy and, and well. We thank you, Lord, for the great doctors and nurses who help all of us. We pray for Pam Rafferty, who is being treated for cancer, and others like her, Ray Malgowski. We thank you, Lord, for ice, for sight. We pray for uh, Charles Wadney and, and Fred Kretrensik. We pray for, Lord, that you would restore their vision. They would have good vision that they would be blessed by you as they think about um, that vision and having that operation. It makes us appreciate our ability to see things all the more. Lord, we thank you for the miracle of people uh, that can hear your word now and for those that have been baptized. And we pray for those that are going to be baptized. As you have told us in your word that you, there is a harvest to come. Help us to think clearly now, Lord, that we might respond properly and live rightly. And for those of us that are troubled by the turmoil in this world, help us to rest in you, that you have said these things, that we may have peace in this world, that there may be tribulation, but take heart, that you have overcome the world. And so, God, we thank you for that. We thank you for that promise. We ask you to bless us now with your word about your heaven. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, it's good to be with all of you. We want to congratulate all of our, our graduates, uh, of course. That's a big milestone, as, uh, as you can imagine. And then one day you blink and you're where I'm at. And, uh, uh, you're, you know, and one of the things uh, that I like to do uh, when I, uh, I'm thinking about going back home is that I, I like to go grab my parents and I put them in the car because they don't drive much anymore and they're afraid to drive a little bit. But I, uh, I get them in the car, and we go get a Coke or lunch at uh, one of their favorite uh, cuisines, like, you know, Wendy's, or, and my mom gets the Biggie Four or whatever. <laughs> and uh, and, and uh, I, like to, I like to drive around, and uh, I, I, uh, I don't know about you, but I'm, I'm kind of reminiscent. Uh, movies tend to make me reminisce about uh, what it was like to grow up in Belpre, Ohio. I was born in 1964. And uh, there was a movie called uh, Sandlot that was uh, set in the 1960s, 1962, a couple years before me, but I related to it because it was a bunch of boys playing baseball every day on the field. 
And uh, there was a guy, a new kid named Smalls, and uh, they, they would say, you're killing me, Smalls, you're killing me. And uh, the, 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 the thing was is that I used to grow up with some of these kids and uh, the way that they acted. But I remember the fields, like when I go back, when I drive by the fields where I used to play baseball, things never stay the same, do they? They, they change. Or there was grass growing up under the field, and there never was grass when I was growing up in the field. Or the field looked 100 million miles bigger than what it is now. Like, I remember I hit a home run in my 11 and 12 league, not to brag. But I, only, I, I hit a couple of them. And I remember the field being huge. And I remember that day like it was yesterday, the glory days. You know, like the Bruce Springs thing song, glory days. Um, yeah, yeah, I'm not going to try to sing it. But, but it's, it's, it's like there's something about it. I, I go back to the baseball fields, the swimming pool where I went to the community pool and uh, going with my friends to school. And I drive by those places, and the school seems so much smaller. And there's not this grandness that I had pictured uh, in my memory. Uh, I think about how things have changed and things haven't been the same and that there's, there's things missing out of it. And I, and I long for that, that place. I long for that sometimes. I long for the life I never had, I guess. Uh, uh, and that longing in us that, that we know that there's, we're not home yet. We always want to look back. We always want to go home. And there's an echo in heaven in all of our lives as we look at this passage. And that we conclude our series in the treasure of heaven with this heavenly perspective from the book of Revelation. And John is getting us encouragement, giving us encouragement to look forward. And uh, we think about heaven, uh, sometimes people have all kinds of opinions about heaven. In 2003, there was a Harris poll that 82% of people believe in heaven, but only 63% expect to get there. And I, I, I don't know how to interpret that. Uh, there's a lot of, you know, just depending on the way they, they ask the question. But that tells me that many people are not looking forward to heaven. They don't have that in their heart that they can look forward to, to, to being there. And how important that is to us as believers. Because in this world, we'll have trouble. Romans 8 starts out, no, there's, there's no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. That's good news. But then it talks about something in the middle that's kind of rough. It talks about futility. It talks about frustration. It talks about God subjecting the creation itself to this, uh, this feeling, a sense of, of, of feeling, a sense of, of things have been spoiled by sin. And in the end, there's no separation from God's love, that all things will work out for the good. All things, all things will work out. But what do we do when we're in the middle of things, the middle of life? And so John is giving a, a glimpse of heaven, heaven's perspective, and we want to think about it because the whole thing about heaven is, is it's looking forward to the return of Christ and that he's the living hope that we have in heaven, that Jesus Christ has risen from the dead. He's called the first fruits. And what does first fruits mean? Well, in the Old Testament, the offering of first fruits brought one bundle of grain to represent and anticipate the entire harvest. I like that. One bundle of grain represents the entire harvest. And Jesus was representative of the entire harvest, that we too will be resurrected one day. But first fruits were also used as an entrance fee. And that Jesus Christ, his first fruits of our resurrection is a sense that he is our entrance fee, free fee into the resurrection of heaven. That Jesus paid our admission to the resurrection with his life. Tim Keller says that it means more than just the fact that Jesus is raised from the dead. He says it's only the first installment on all of this, the new heavens, the new earth, and the new city the city of God. And we need to consider why jo, jo, um, John wrote the book the way he did. And that way we may understand it better. People often say that the book of Revelation was symbols and strange things, but it's a book of Revelation that was written about a group of people, a group of churches, who were facing some terrible things to give them a living hope. And if we understand that Jesus was raised from the dead, and that he was our first installment of what is to come, it will give us a living hope to face the things in this life we wouldn't have without this hope. 
Today, we turn in our Bibles to Revelation 21, 1 through 7. I want to give you four reasons why we should have a treasure of heaven in our hearts as we get through this turmoil of this world. The first word is testing. They all begin with T. There's a testing. Life is a test. And that we must trust. That's the second T. And that we must believe it. We must obey it. We must believe it and be blessed by it. Because in this world, Jesus said, we'll have trouble. But take heart. He has overcome the trouble. Overcome means triumphant. He is triumphant over the trouble. He's victorious over that trouble. And the last is that we will receive the treasure in heaven. We'll receive the crown of life, eternal life. We'll be given access by Jesus Christ. So when we talk about heaven, some people think that heaven is, is just pie in the sky stuff about the sweet by and by. Well, I don't know about you, but I like pie. But we do need to talk about the nasty now and now. Because sometimes it is nasty. Let's deal with this in the first place. Let's get this out of the way. That They say life is a test. And that we know that Satan, the sinister minister of, of the devil, is always is out there. He's always out there trying to create a counterfeit. And we see a counterfeit in what he introduces in the, the book of Revelation, actually, in verse 16, 17, 18. Uh, the city of Babylon, the great city of Babylon, is modern-day Iraq. But ancient Babylon was built by Nimrod. And old Nimrod was a type of the Antichrist. His very name means rebel. And that Babylon is the cradle and the grave of false religion. Now, it's interesting to me, because Babylon has many distinctives throughout Scripture, so I'm gonna, we're going to get a, an overview of the city of Babylon, sometimes to be known as the city of the man, sometimes to be known as the city of Satan, sin city. But it's interesting to me that the people of God were exiled to Babylon. They were kicked out of Jerusalem. Jerusalem is the city of God, supposed to be the city of God, but it wasn't much, it was sinning. They were sinning. The people were sinning. So he sent them into Babylon. They were in captivity, remember, and they were supposed to be there for 70 years. And that at some point, he would pull them out of Babylon. It's a place of confusion in Genesis 11. Remember, that's where they built the Tower of Babel. Babel means confusion. And that God said that they, if they accomplish this, man will be able to do anything. And then, he, and then he, what did he do? He spread them out. He divided them. How did he divide them? Because he divided them by their language. They couldn't understand each other. Uh, just to mention this in, in thinking, when did God bring people back together and by the power of the Holy Spirit? Acts chapter 2, right? What did the power of the Holy Spirit do? They were able to hear the gospel in their own language. God started to restore things back then. But he's always been doing that. He's always been gathering people since the time of Genesis. It saddens God that we sinned and fell away. So Babylon is a place of confusion. It's also a place of evil. As we think about what uh, Babylon stands for, it is a place of confusion and an apostate religion and that they kill people. They want you to convert to their ways, the ways of man. And so we see this going on constantly. In chapter 17, Babylon's gardens, they're beautiful, but the ba Babylon itself is extremely pagan. We said that before. It represents a prostitute. It's, it's the beauty of the bride of Christ here is compared to the beast, right? The counterfeit is the beast. And, and so as we look at this, we see in verse 2 of chapter 17 of Revelation, if you want to turn there, he says, Come, I will show you the judgment of the great prostitute who is seated on many waters with whom kings of the earth have committed sexual immorality and with wine of whose sexual immorality the dwellers on the earth have become drunk. I like that picture. I like that picture because he's talking about um, this place of temptation, that the people have been drawn in by. 
and that they've prostituted themselves. And she is considered to be drunk with the blood of the martyrs. She is loud and lewd in her character. She is called the prostitute, a harlot. And she's riding on the beast. People who are not saved will marvel at her, the Bible says. In Revelation 17, 8, it says, The beast that you saw was and is not and is about to rise from the bottomless pit and go to destruction. And the dwellers of the earth whose name has not been written in the book of life from the foundation of the world will marvel to see the beast because it was and is not and is to come. There's going to be this miraculous sign. They will be seduced by the pleasures of the beast. Seductive as she is, the governmental system that uses immoral means to gain its own pleasure, prosperity, and advantage will be attractive to the kings of the earth. In Revelation 17, 18, it says, And the woman that you saw in the great city has dominion over the kings of the earth. She is called a great city, a place of confusion, a place of exile, where God's people were told to marry and multiply and seek the welfare of the city. But that God said that he will come and take you out of that city. He wants them to leave. He doesn't want them to stay in this city. Biblically, it's viewed as the devil's city. Jerusalem is God's city. And here we have this counterfeit. She is called Babylon. She is the dwelling of demons. She is a place of of destruction in Revelation 17 where there is temptation and trials. And she's also a dwelling for demons. Re Revelation 18, 2 says, And he called out with a mighty voice, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. She has become a dwelling place for demons, a haunt for every unclean spirit, a haunt for every unclean bird, a haunt for every unclean and detestable beast. You ever heard of the dirty birds? This is the epitome of the dirty birds. This is a place that, that where there is detestable things going on. There is confusion, as we can see, exile. It's a place where, where God's people were sent, a physical place. It was an actual city back here. But when you get into Revelation 17 and 18, it's almost like it's a spiritual place, a place of darkness, a place that has influence in the world. Matter of fact, in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 7, it, it talks about the mystery of iniquity, that there's a, there's a lawlessness that's going on, and the men of lawlessness will soon be revealed. He's covered up and he's disguised now, but he will be revealed in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. And in 2 Thessalonians, it tells us, in uh, chapter 1, it says, rest in us. In other words, rest in those who believe in the return of Christ, that we have a hope even amidst all of this. Don't you get tired of, of all the stuff that's going on with Babylon? I'm talking about the world's influence on the lives of people today. I mean, why is Mattel making a RuPaul doll for children? As you heard, if you were at family, uh, our family gathering last night, Meredith was talking about how her heart is to, to give a place for children to come and learn about the Lord Jesus, a place where they can be fed the Word of God. Why is Buzz Lightyear, why is Mickey Mouse trying to teach kids about same-sex attraction? Why is that? Because they have fallen under the spell of Babylon. The people are warned in Revelation 18, verse 4. Then I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, lest you take part in her sins, lest you share in her plagues. For her sins are heaped up as high as the heaven, and God has remembered her iniquities. Remember I said, 2 Thessalonians 2.7 says, For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. It's in the King James Version. I like the mystery of iniquities. In my ESV, it's called lawlessness. And he, he who now letteth will let until he will be taken out of the way. And then the, sh the wicked sh will be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and destroy those with brightness of his coming. 
Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all of his power and signs and lying and wonders. He's going to fool people. He's fooling people today. He's at work today. And the world can't see it. They're blind. And, and God takes no pleasure in this, and neither should we. We should just keep preaching the gospel. We have the hope of eternal life. But Babylon is defiant as she is depraved. That's what Adrian Rogers says. He says this, have you noticed that sin used to slink down the back streets is now walking down the main street? That's so true. They put it right out in your face. George Barnett said something about st statistics about spiritual con conversations going on in the digital world with young people. He says, three out of five Christian millennials believe that people today are more likely than in the past to take offense if you share their faith, if you share faith with them. That 65% that of them will feel that way. And that the higher, uh, that's higher among boomer Christians, 28%. Millennials also are three times more likely, Gen Xs are three times more likely than boomers and elders, than any other generation group to believe that disagreement means judgment. We don't judge people. We're judging sin, the fruit, but we don't judge people. God's going to judge people. God's saying, come out of Babylon. He told his people back in Jeremiah 29, 11, he says, come out. There'll be a time when you will come out. And there's, there's two voices that we have to be, be aware of that, that uh, Dr. Messer talked about at the baccalaureate service on, on Friday before the kids graduated at Grove City was that, that they, have to, they have to be careful that they don't believe in that God's going to judge this world. And that they risk, when they, when they diminish and minimize the judgment of God, in other words, that there's going to be a judgment, that right and wrong will be made right and wrong, and that nobody's going to get away with anything, that we're, we're tempted towards apathy, which is not caring, or hedonism. Give in and go along. And so you see this here in, in Revelation or in Romans chapter 8. The, 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 the temptation is for all of us that when we feel and we see all of these things, that the, the depravity, we almost feel overwhelmed. But, but he says, come out of her. And, and because she's going to be judged. In, in, in Re Revelation 18, 6, she's destined for destruction. It says, pay her back as she herself has been paid others and repay her double for her deeds, mix a double portion for her in the cup she mixed. In other words, double trouble. And if you share in her iniquity, you're going to share in her plague. Come out, he's saying. Repent. You don't have to stay there. You realize some of the people in Jerusalem, or they stayed in Babylon. And we're tempted to stay in Babylon. And then there's the other people who say that, that, uh, that uh, um, they don't fear God's judgment. And they don't think that God has any power to save us. They've given up. So we have to be careful of that. In Romans 8, it says that there's a sense of futility that comes. There's a groaning inwardly as we wait eagerly on the Lord Jesus. But, but God says, I'm going to fulfill my promises. I'm going to bring you back from your exile. I'm going to bless you. And where does he say he's going to bring him back? To Jerusalem, right? But that's never really realized until you get to Revelation 21 and 22. when God renews everything and restores everything. Now, this city has fallen under God's judgments. It says in verse 8 of Revelation 18, for this reason her plagues will come in a single day, death and mourning and famine. She will be burned up with fire, for mighty is the Lord God who has judged her. We are told to come out of the world. What fellowship can light have with darkness? What harmony is there between Christ and Belial? Or what does the believer have in common with an unbeliever? What agreement is there between the temple of God and idols? For we are the temple of the living God. Therefore, come out and be separate, says the Lord. Touch no unclean thing. 2 Corinthians 6, verses 14 through 17. During the tribulation, when people around the world see this destruction of Babylon the Great, there are some people that will mourn the loss. Those people that have given in. 
and given up. But the Christian, those who hope in her, will rejoice over God's power, over his return. And so we have to be careful not to be deceived. In life, you will be tested. Life is a testing. Life is a test. We will come under trial. What did Jesus tell us? In the face of testing and trial, in the face of trouble, do not let your hearts be troubled. The city of God is coming, right? What did God talk about? What did Jesus talk about in John 14? He talked about heaven. He, he talked about what it is that we need to do. The um, medicine for the troubled heart. Don't you get troubled when you see all this stuff going on? The medicine for the troubled heart is to trust in God. In my Father's house, there are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you I go away to prepare a place for you. He said, trust in God, trust also in me. And if I go away and prepare a place for you, I will come again and take you to myself where I am. You may be also, and you know the way to where I am going. Jesus is talking about a physical place, the city of God. You see, we talked about the beast. Now we're talking about beauty, beauty and the beast, right? Yeah, nothing to do with that thing. But what we're talking about is this beautiful bride that's coming. What does Jesus talk about? A physical city. John has given this glimpse. Look at chapter 21 in Revelation. It says, Then I saw new heavens and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city. What is it? The holy city. What is it? What's the name of the place? The new Jerusalem. What did God tell people back in Jeremiah? I'm going to bring you out of there. This is where he brings us out, into the holy city. And it's a great place. It's a beautiful bride. It has been prepared, it says, as a bride adorned for a husband. That's us. That's the church. And the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 5, when he's talking about marriage, he says the husband presents the bride to the father without wrinkle, stain, or blemish. I've preached that 100 million times here. And what I'm saying is, that the, the groom has no sense of throwing his bride under the bus like we do with our husbands and wives do when they're married. And they say, oh, it's my wife's fault. Oh, it's my husband's fault. The old ball and chain. No, none of that. Jesus presents this bride beautifully adorned. She's, she's beautiful. He doesn't throw her under the bus. He presents her as a beautiful bride, it says. A, a, a ceremony marking the, the beginning of the end. And when we have the end in mind, we can do better in the beginning. We can do better now, in the nasty now and now. See, the hope that we have is that Christ is coming and that Christ is bringing with him. He's the first fruits, and he is bringing with him the holy city, the new Jerusalem. And he's going to gather a people to himself. And it said that in Revelation 7, that the people are gathered, and they are what? They are singing praises to God. They are serving the Lord's purposes and they are sheltered in his presence. I love that. That's why I keep repeating it. The people right now are in heaven. They are sheltered in his presence. They are satisfied in his presence. They have no need, no lack. And so they are in God's presence and they are celebrating today. In contrast to the prostitute, the the church bride is pure and she's obedient. The wicked city of Babylon contrasts the heavenly city of Jerusalem. The original readers probably rather quickly identified Babylon with Rome, city on seven hills. But Babylon also symbolizes any system that is hostile to God. But notice what it says. It says it is the dwelling place of God is with men. You remember, why is that important? Well, it's basically talking about restoring something that was separated back in Genesis, that God could no longer be with man. He, he couldn't dwell with man. And the whole time, God is trying to dwell with man. So how did he try to dwell with man? He set up the tabernacle, and he would say that he would come, and they would come, and they'd pray, and only the priest could have come to him. But God is constantly trying to get his people back, constantly trying to restore the relationship with man. And so here we see the dwelling place of, of God is with man, that our relationship with God is, is restored. It's put right. You will live in a world you never really experienced. The story of the journey begins in a garden that winds up in a city where God dwells. In the garden, our relationship with the Lord was broken in the garden. 
when our relationship with God is harmed, our relationship with one another was harmed. Remember, Adam and Eve started blaming each other. They said, that man you put me here with, that woman you put me here with, it's the devil that did it, just like Flip Wilson. But what else happened? Creation was impacted. When our relationship with God is hurt and harmed by sin, our relationship with each other is harmed and hurt with each other, and our relationship with nature. We started getting older and dying at this point. Shame started coming in. They hid from God. Insecurity, all right there. It all came in. God says, I'm going to restore that. The dwelling place of God is going to be with man. That's good news. And that's the hope that we have, that God's going to restore this. That, that we, we're going to have a sense that we, we're in God's presence. We were exiled out of our true home. We had no access to the tree of life. There was an echo of the true home longing in our hearts. Life became thorny. We had to work by the sweat of our brow. But God is going to put everything right. We are going to have a living relationship with God. And the bride is united with Christ and reunited with friends and family who believe in Jesus Christ. That's quite a promise. Jesus' resurrection isn't just living again. It's living again in a new body. The new body is based on our old body, but it's perfectly suited for life and eternity. Jesus was not the first one brought back from the dead, but he was the first one resurrected. Heaven is a physical world where people are not just a bunch of disembodied spirits floating around in the clouds, playing harps. Oh, no. God's got something better for us, friend. Life without sin, sadness, and death. We are in a body that we have a living relationship with God, that we're living in a new body, and it's a life without sin, sadness, and death. Now, I want you to think about this. Keller talks about this in a, in a, in a sermon that he talks about, that it's just interesting. This isn't just interesting teaching. It's not just uh, uh, pie in the sky stuff, that it's a life-changing transformation if you understand it. Who was John's audience? John's audience, if you wanted to go back, you could look in chapter 2 and 3, uh, but you can look at verse 4 here. He's writing to people who have experienced more death, more crying, more dying, more pain, more suffering than any other one in history and in this probably in this room. You would not endure persecution for pie in the sky. If it was, you know, something that's not real. It's not fantasy. The hope of heaven was very real to them in the time of the Roman emperor Domitian would be the same time that he's writing this letter to. People were under the, under, uh, being persecuted under his rule to a new level. He was plung, pillaging their homes. They would be thrown into an arena. They would have their bodies torn apart by wild animals, and Christians were impaled on snakes, on stakes and covered with pitch and set on fire. Christians were crucified by the hundreds along the roads so people would see them dying by inches. You don't die for pie in the sky, friend. These people were dying because they believed in Jesus Christ and would not renounce it. What did John give them? What was he trying to do? He was trying to give them the new heavens and the new earth to face the persecution and the suffering that they were facing. It's the hope of heaven that enabled them to endure because it says in verse 4, he will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more. Neither shall their mourning nor crying nor pain anymore for the former things have passed away. Behold, I'm making all things new. He who is seated on the throne, behold, I am making all things new. Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. God is making all things new. Who will get into heaven? People who thirst. People who are triumphant. Look what it says in 21 verse 6. And he said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, to the thirsty to the thirsty, I will give the springs of living water. Who invite, who's invited? Everyone. Isaiah 55 says, come. Come. Everyone, it says, who thirsts. 
Come to the waters, he who has no money, come buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without price. What is the qualification? I must thirst. To those who thirst. Are you thirsty? Do you long for something more? Do you long for the hope of heaven to be realized? To those who overcome, it's the word Nike. We get the word Nike. I think that's pronounced Nico. But we get the word Nike, victory, overcomer. I keep thinking of that song that Gal wrote that, that's called Overcomer. I'd try to sing it for you, but I, I'd just tear it apart. But, but there's a song that's a, so good about being an overcomer. That we need to be overcomers. Those who are not satisfied in this world and those who are not satisfied with what's going on in this world that look to Christ and look for this hope will be satisfied with this water. And that to those who thirst and to those who overcome, the Bible says that they will have a heritage. They will take part in the full heritage of this, this opportunity. If you read 21 and you look at verse Seven, and then it says, the one who conquers will have this heritage. I will be his God and he will be my son. But to those that are satisfied with this world and its enjoyments for a portion and seek not for happiness and favor for God, this is Matthew Henry, those that depend upon the merit of their own works for righteousness and see no need they have for Christ and his righteousness, they do not thirst. They have no sense of their need are in no pain and uneasiness about their soul they will not condescend to Jesus Christ. But those who thirst are invited to the waters. Those that labor and are heavy laden are invited to Christ to rest. To those who overcome, they will have this heritage and God will be their God. And he will, it says there, those who have a heritage, I will be his God and he will be my son. You know that's repeated in Jeremiah, not in chapter 29. But later on in chapters 32, I think, that I will gather my people, and they will be my people, and I will be their God. And so the life will be restored to the overcomers. As we think about what God has for us in this, you remember what he said to the woman at the well. Woman, if you ask me for the drink, the water, I would give you water, the water that would bubble up in you, that would never stop. It would be springs of living water. I would give you the water of life. And she said, what did she say to her? Give me this water. Where do you find this stuff at? You find it in Jesus, friend. Those who are triumphant, they will receive the treasure that is in the heritage of Christ. They will receive satisfaction. He told the woman at the well, you will never thirst again. You'll never long for anything. All things are being made new. Those who do will come and receive the treasure of heaven. They will take the water of life and they will eat from the tree of life. Now that's an interesting statement, isn't it, as we conclude here? As we think about that? As we think about where we were at before in the garden, we couldn't have access to the tree of life. But now we do. And look at Revelation 22. The angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal flowing from the throne of God, the land, the symbol of eternal life. What did Jesus say on the cross? I thirst. Jesus said on the cross, I thirst. How is it that we can take from the water of life now? Because Christ took our thirst and gave us his, his satisfaction, his life. Our death, he took. He gave us his life. Jesus said after, he said, I thirst. He says, it is finished. I thirst. And he took that drink in our place. How did we have access to the tree of life? Because it says in Revelation 22, and he showed me a pure river of water of life. It's in the proceeding out of the throne of God in the midst of the lamb. And in that midst, the river, there was the tree of life, and that it bears 12 fruits, yielded her fruit every month, and the leaves of the trees were for healing of the nations. 
How do we access the tree of life? What does he say in verse 3 in Revelation 22? There shall be no more curse. Jesus climbed up on the tree. He became the curse for us. He took our curse and gave us his blessing, his life in our place. Galatians 3.13 says, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree, so that in Christ Jesus the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles, so that we might receive the promised spirit of faith. Jesus took our thirst. Heaven's brochure, my friend, is found in Revelation. In the book of Genesis, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. In the book of Revelation, he brings the new heavens and the new earth. In Genesis, we see the first Adam who's reigning on the earth. In the book of Revelation, we see Jesus, the last Adam, reigning in glory. In Genesis, we see the earthly bride brought to the first Adam. In the book of Revelation, we see the heavenly bride, that's us, brought to the Lord Jesus Christ, the last Adam. In the book of Genesis, we see the book beginning with death and curse. In the book of Revelation, we see the curse is removed because of the Savior who came to save us. In Genesis, man is driven from God's face because of sin. In Revelation, we see God's glory in God's face because of Jesus. In Genesis, we see Satan for the first time. In Revelation... We see him for the last time. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches, to the one who conquers, to the one who overcomes, I will grant you to eat from the tree of life. The Spirit of the bride says, come, and let the one who hears says, come, and let the one who is thirsty come. My friend, life is a test. But that shouldn't trouble us. We need to trust. We need to take heart. Jesus has overcome the world. Jesus has overcome Satan, sin, and sadness, and death. Trust in Jesus. Pray. Hold fast. And stand firm. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for your word. As we look to you now, as we see this, in our world today, the things that go on, the things that are frustrating and seem futile, seem to be overwhelming us, Lord. I pray, God, that we would push back, that we would hold on, that we would not worry and let our hearts worry and be troubled, but we would trust in God and trust also you and you that heaven is our home and we will be home soon. It's in Jesus' name we pray and trust. Amen. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you that you are for us. As we hear the words of the benediction now, Lord, we consecrate this message to you and for you and for us. May our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God and Father who loved us give us eternal comfort and good, hope through his grace, comfort for our hearts, and establish us in every good work and word. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you.